it wouldn't shock me if Bo was a top four or five quarterback in the SEC after this season. It may not be that way in, as far as like passing yardage or anything like that because I don't think Auburn's offense under Harson is going to put up a million yards and a million points. But as far as efficiency and time of possession – and yards per play, stats that actually win you football games, not total yardage. Um, I, I think that's going to be a lot of things that Bo improves on in 2021. What's up, y'all? That was Zach Blackerby, host of Locked On Auburn. You are listening to Talking SEC, your weekly look at all things SEC football. I am your host, Philip Jordan, for Last Word on College Football, and I see point nine the legend, Dustin Alabama, where I'm the in-studio host and producer of the Woods Football. We appreciate you guys checking out the show this week. I know there wasn't one last week, just some transition stuff where uh, the show can be found as a host. That is all squared away, back for weekly episodes. And getting back to previewing, each and every SEC team for the upcoming season. Today, we are talking Auburn football, new head coach Brian Harson. what's going to happen with Bo Nix. I'm very intrigued by the offensive line at Auburn. Defense should be also very intriguing with Derek Mason there as defense coordinator. And with Zach, we are going to look at the schedule and kind of see what is a good spot for Auburn to be at at the end of the season. Before I bring Zach on, I'll let you guys know if you can find me in the podcast you can follow me on social media at P. Jordan SEC. The podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all your favorite podcast platforms. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please follow, rate, and review. Leave a review. I will read it on a future edition of the show. And you can always email me at sports.philipjordan at gmail.com. Now let's preview the Auburn Tigers. Everybody joining me today, we're previewing the Auburn Tigers here on Talking SEC, and joining me is Zach Blackerby, host of Locked on Auburn. And Zach, it is always good to, to have you on the show, and I appreciate you taking the time. Hey, Philip. No, man, I, uh, I'm i excited to be on with you yet again. Uh, always appreciate it. Oh, yeah, it's always good to have you on. All your excellent, knowledgeable Auburn takes, and uh, Auburn is an interesting team coming into this upcoming season. I think the last time me and you talked was like the week after Brian Harson got hired, so a lot has happened on, on the plane since then. Yeah, yeah, and you know, we saw a little bit of stuff regarding like what's happened on the field since Brian harson has been hired, but really everything that we've heard has been, you know, culture and how he's doing things differently and how folks that are you know, I've been around Auburn for a while. It seems different than it has for the, you know, the previous eight seasons. And so that's come and, and gone. You know, I think people have kind of adjusted and, and adapted to the fact that culturally, Brian Harson is going to have to change some things. And what all that actually means for what happens on the field, I don't think we really know the answer yet. I think as far as what we've seen regarding A Day has been okay, players are bigger. Uh, it sounds like the strength and conditioning program is like nothing that these players have ever endured before, which for some of these upperclassmen is a bit concerning, but uh, it's good that Auburn has that in, in place now. But um, yeah, it's been a, it's been an interesting off season following how Brian Harson's changing some things up. You know, and, and you react a lot with the Auburn fans through so your podcast, you know, and, and Twitter and social media, stuff like that. You know, because when we talked when he got hired, and I was the same way as you, I think we were both kind of like waiting, see, not sure. You know, he's coming from Boise. We'll see how it works. Uh, how do you think now we are basically six months removed from his hiring? The Auburn fans have, have responded to Brian Harson. I think the more Auburn fans hear about him, the more they like him. And I think in his first press conference, you know, I mean, I guess it's a little over six months ago now, that Christmas Eve press conference where they introduced him, he won a lot of people over. He was very intense. He kind of got up there and told his life story and who he was. You know, Gus didn't really have to do that. It was a little bit different of a situation, and that's kind of all we had to compare it to recently just because it's been so long. And – he answered a few questions that most of them were about recruiting and how are, how is he going to recruit against Alabama, which he danced around the question and didn't really know. And, um, or I guess he, he just didn't really say much else other than he's going to come in and, and focus on Auburn. But I think his intensity really won over a lot of fans that day. 
And ever since then, I think he's been gaining Auburn fans' trust more and more with the way that they've kind of dealt with the roster management side of things in regards to the transfer portal because the recruiting situation he inherited for the 2020 class uh, or the 2021 class rather was pretty was pretty rough and so he filled out that class essentially by getting some upperclassmen some guys that have three or four years left of eligibility as well as some guys that are like you know the traditional grad transfers that have one year left of eligibility so it'll be cool to see how he uses that mix of talent pretty much all those guys are going to the defensive side of the football and then of course you know as more and more people dig up stats about his success at Boise State um it looks like his offense is going to be improved too based on, you know, what Auburn did last year to what Auburn could possibly do in 2021. So I think Auburn fans are excited about him. Okay. So let's jump over to the offense and I'm not going to start. I know a lot of people when they talk Auburn, they, they all make them jump the bonix. So we're not going to do that here. We're, we are going to talk offensive line and that's where I wanted to kick things off because it is an experienced group. And I don't know where you sit at this, but I'm always kind of the guy, and I hear somebody say, well, they're very experienced. I'm like, well, just because you're experienced don't mean you're good at something. You know, you could do something for a long time and not be good. And Auburn has struggled at offensive line. And I think that just dictates everything with this offense. I mean, any offensive football, that's where it starts up front. And this group has, whoever's been at offensive line, they have struggled the last couple of seasons. This dates back to Jarrett Stidham. A lot of issues I see Bo Nix had the last two years. I saw Jarrett Stidham have his final year at Auburn. Where are you at when you look at this offensive line and where they can grow and improve? You know, with Harson and Mike Bobo's office coordinator, with his staff, you know, what is your outlook for this offensive line this upcoming season? Well, you're definitely right. Just because you're more experienced in something doesn't mean you get better. One year older does not mean one year better. And the big thing is, like, okay, what are they going to do scheme wise to help these players out? I think it's telling, Philip, that. You know, he went and got a bunch of guys in the transfer portal, and none of them were offensive linemen. They did reach out to offensive linemen, but they didn't get any offensive linemen. So you could read that as, okay, maybe they got in there, and it's like, all right, they were just using these guys wrong, or he believes in, you know, what's in front of them. I don't know. I don't know. And I definitely think you can look at some of the scheme and the play calling last year and be like, okay, that did not help. The skill players out. It didn't help the running back out. It didn't help the quarterback out. It didn't help the offensive line out. So I think... That's one way to look at it. All these reports coming out that Harson wants to run, you know, just this hard-nosed, blue-collar style of football where they just run it and run it and run it and just beat the crap out of you over the course of 60 minutes. And, you know, you pull away as the game goes on just because you wear the other team down. And I think they've got a lot of those pieces in place to do that. I don't know if they necessarily have it in the offensive line. I'm a little skeptical of it moving forward, but... I think there are some things to like about it. Um, All these guys gain weight. They seem to be bigger and stronger and more in shape based on the videos that we've kind of seen. And the big question is, okay, Auburn was soft in the trenches on both sides of the ball last year. The offensive line got pushed around a ton. Can you change that in six months to an offseason? Can you change the mindset of a group of five men that, you know, okay, you instead of you're going to be bullied, you're going to bully opposing defensive players. I don't know if he can do that in one off season, but I think he's going to try. And like I said, I think it's encouraging in an off season where you could go out and get dudes um, easier than ever that are ready to play day one. He didn't, um, and I think that, I, I think you can take something positive away from that. You know, and that is quite a transition too. If you know he he's going to come out to be more of a blue collar style of offense, and I'm not saying it's completely to this degree, but I don't know if you remember back when Tommy Toberville's final year when he tried to went from that kind of offense to the spread. It did work. I mean, you're you're taking guys that did one thing and asking them to do something else. So I'm kind of that actually kind of I start thinking about. It. I wonder how that's just going to look when we do get the get the games. You know, can these guys make that transition to something a little bit different than what they've been doing? I think they can. I mean, when Gus Malzahn's offense was at its best, it was a running football team, you know, uh, and they did it in different ways. But whether it was Trey Mason or Peyton Barber or, uh, you know, even carry on, carry on's a different style back. But all of these guys were downhill runners. I think Tank is going to be a little bit more like Trey Mason where it's one cut and go. 
And I think that's what we've seen from a lot of Brian Harson's successful Boise State backs. I mean, he's put some really good backs into the league. Um, and so I think these guys want to run the football. They were recruited to Auburn to run the football. But I think it's going to look different stylistically. I think formationally it's going to be different. I think you're going to see more tight ends on the field. You're probably going to see two tight ends a lot of the time. And I think you're going to see Bo Nix under center. You may see a traditional fullback back there that may or may not be a tight end, maybe a six lineman. We'll see what they do with that. Um, and I think you're going to see some single back sets where Tank Bigsby is the only guy in the backfield. Bo Nix is under center. And you may even see it with um, with, with, with Hunter, you know, the, the, the hot shot guy that's kind of gaining a lot of conversation and attention this week from Mississippi, the true freshman. And then also Sean Shivers, of course, is going to be a really solid number two back. It's going to be fun to see how they use those three guys in the running game. But you, these guys came to Auburn to be a part of an offense that runs the football. So I don't think that's necessarily going to change. But this offensive line, you're going to have to get better on the offensive line to do what Brian Harson wants to do, and that is to run the ball no matter who you are and also to win 10-plus games a year. So – uh, it starts up front. We all know that. But having a guy like Tank Bixby and Sean Shivers will definitely help. Most definitely. And I, I, you just said something. You said it twice uh, in that, you know, the couple sentences there. That I think it's going to make a lot of Auburn fans happy because I see it on Facebook and Twitter complain all the time. Tight end. There's there's going to be a tight end on the field and be used with Auburn now. And I know that's been uh, concern and anger and all kind of uh, different emotions on, on me, online. But Auburn fans, like, why didn't Gus Malzahn use a tight end? And that seems like a big departure, you know, compared to what, you know, Harson's going to do offensively. You're going to see the tight end and more than one out there on the field. Yeah. And Malzahn had a tight end on the play, uh, on the field all the time. They just, he just didn't throw to him. And I don't yeah. know how much Harson's going to throw to him either. Um, you know, there's been talk about Harson building this offense and this passing game inside out. I don't know if I necessarily buy that fully. I think you're going to see more of it. I mean, the first play in a day uh, was Bo Nix throwing to a tight end, which I think um, may have been planned. I think that's a little funny, but <laughs> you know, just because you see two tight ends on the field doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be involved in the passing yeah. game. I mean, w w we've seen that before, but you know, it's like Shedrick Jackson, um, he played a lot of snaps last year, but he didn't, you know, he wasn't involved in the passing game. It's like he was just a blocker whenever he's been on the field. So we'll see. We'll see uh, what it like, what that actually looks like. But, you know, maybe they use it more in the passing game. I, I think it would make sense. I mean, there's so much inexperience on this offense as far as like skill positions go. Um, I mean, John Samuel Shanker, as far as like positions that catch the football, because, like, Sean Shivers, I believe, is the leader, leading receiver coming back. But after him, I think it's John Samuel Shanker. And then um, then it's a pretty big drop-off. So we'll see. We'll see what they do with the, the, the tight end in the passing game. Yeah, so uh, so now since any Auburn fan listening to this right now will not yell at me through their phone or device, we are now going to talk about quarterbacks. We're 10 minutes into this conversation. We are now just now jumping into quarterback uh, and with Bo Nix. And, look, obviously he took a step back from his sophomore year, but there, I think there's a lot of – parts of this offense took a step back i mean I've, I've been a defender of him to a degree and of course they bring in tj he's come you know tj finley's coming in as well i've got some opinions there with him as quarterback but for bo nicks you know all the normal things leaving the pocket early you know fundamental stuff that but for him for his junior year or his third year where does he need to go with his game what what is the most important part of his improvement to take that next step and be a solid quarterback and kind of get some of those uh, complaints that we hear from Auburn fans all the time, kind of get that off of his back. Yeah, just some consistency. I, I think, you know, staying in the pockets, you know, the most talked about thing. I think that one's pretty clear. That one's pretty obvious. Other things, I mean, you know, just throwing off his back foot when he doesn't need to, and that's something that he knows. I got a feeling Harson's just going to have that drilled into his head over the course of the off season, and then he's just got to get more consistent, you know, on, on some of these passes that. He should be making. I mean, there's definitely definitely been passes where it's like, OK, what in the world? You can make a throw when there's guys draped all over you and then you get a clean pocket and you overthrow a guy by 10 yards. So it's just uh, putting it all together. I think he's close. I think he's uh, he's pretty close. And it wouldn't shock me if Bo was a top four or five quarterback in the SEC after this season. It may not be that way. And as far as like passing yardage 
or anything like that because I don't think Auburn's offense under Harson is going to put up a million yards and a million points. But as far as efficiency and time of possession and yards per play, stats that actually win you football games, not total yardage, um, I, I think that's going to be a lot of things that Bo improves on in 2021. So um, I, I feel like when we talk about offensive line, if TJ Finley might be in trouble if he gets out there on the field because he's not mobile. The, Bo, at least if the pressure collapses, we know he can get away. Where are you at on the TJ Finley deal there at Auburn? I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it makes a lot of sense for 2021. I think it makes a lot of sense for 2022. And I think it makes a lot of sense for 2023. Um, I think Auburn improved a lot in the backup quarterback position this season because Grant Loy wasn't going to do it. And, and I was high on Grant Loy when he transferred to Auburn. I whiffed on that. He has not developed at all. And D. Davis, as a true freshman, I don't think he's a, a true SEC pastor day one. I think he will be going into his his third year. But right now, he, I don't think he's ready to, to be uh, a reliable backup. So I think Finley's, uh, Finley's a potential uh, potential one step away or one play away kind of guy that you feel okay with. And then as far as, you know, life at Auburn after Bo Nix, I don't think Bo goes pro after this season. I think he stays for another year. But after that, I think Finley's going to really know this offense uh, by the time, you know, they go into the 2023 season. He's probably going to be the favorite to be the guy after Bo Nix unless D. Davis or Holden Garen or really, really show out. I mean, that is just so long from now. Mm-hmm. But it, it kind of sets up some things in regards to, okay, Finley could come in, he could play a year or two, then it's probably holding Gariner for a year or two, and you know Auburn will have its next quarterback by then. So I think it makes a lot of sense. As far as him not being mobile, Harson's one with a lot of non-mobile quarterbacks. I don't think that's, that's something that he really, really needs. Early on in his time at Boise, when he had some more athletic quarterbacks, um, they were second or third in rushing on the team. And then as he kind of got his system more and more set in place, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, they didn't run the ball at all because that wasn't their strength. And so I, uh, he's a different style quarterback than Bo Nix. There's no question about it. But also, like, this dude can throw it 80 yards. Mm-hmm. I don't think Bo Nix can throw it 80 yards. So, I mean, Harson's going to use the strength of his players, and I think that's something that's going to be very, very fun to see. And it's a, it's a key part. You know, he talks about it, competition. And that, that's what this brings. There's a guy sitting behind you that, you know, just has played SEC games, is capable of coming out there and play. So that's a, that's going to be interesting. You know, we, I'm, would you, I mean, Bo Nix is the quarterback. I believe he starts day one, but it is good. I think it is good for the whole team and good, probably good for Bo Nix to have that guy behind him that's got some SEC playing experience now. Yeah, there's no question about it. There's no question about it. The interesting thing over the next few weeks that we will see is if Bo Nix goes to media days or not, if he's one of the guys that represents Auburn at media days, and everyone's like, well, of course he is. Of course he's going to be. And my thing is like, okay, how do you sell Finley that it's a quarterback competition if you take Bo Nix to media days after he started for you for two years? All of a sudden it's like, Mm -hmm. oh, he was just telling him that to get him on campus. And then how does he respond to that? So that's my thing that I'm watching in the quarterbacks this offseason. There you go. Hey, that's just right a corner, around the corner too. So we'll we'll be we'll be finding out uh, here pretty soon if if Bo Nix does go with them. You know, and uh, kind of took a little, little long there on the offense, just on this on the defense side of the ball. Uh, you look at linebackers. You, you get you know always like Jacoby McLean and you know Owen Papo, and then you know in the secondary, Roger McCurry and Smoke Monday. You got them back there, but up front on the defensive line, um, obviously took a step back last year with what they lost the year before. Uh, where are you at on this defensive line and just overall on this defense, you know, with new defensive coordinator Derek Mason? I uh, love the Derek Mason hire. I think it makes a lot of sense. I love the idea of the new scheme that he's going to implement. It's going to be fun to see this defense adjust to it based on how the players talked about it during spring. It seems like they were really into it and really liked it. And then uh, kind of looking at it from other angles, I think the defensive line – will be the weakest of the three layers of this defense. I think you mentioned Zacoby McClain, Owen Papo. You can make the argument they're one of the best linebacking cores uh, or tandems in, in the country, let alone the SEC. I firmly believe that. And then defensive backfield, incredibly deep. Incredibly deep. They've got the a, a great balance of guys that need to perform well this year because it'll be their last year at Auburn. 
and also a nice balance of guys that are going to be the guys moving forward. Um, you know, after Smoke Monday, Roger McCreary leave. So that uh, those are all things that I'm excited about regarding this defense. Yeah, I, I was. You know, I'm a big fan of Derek Mason. Uh, he did have some decent seasons at Vanderbilt, but as a defensive coordinator, what he did at Stanford, I mean, that was a tremendous hire. I was honestly surprised because I, I was kind of, you know, because I had seen stuff that he might would go to the NFL or something. But uh, obviously, we know Harson at least on that end, he he can recruit. So uh, on the on the schedule, real quickly, um, you open up at Akron, Alabama State, obviously. Should be a two and zero start. Believe very important games because you know you can really set the tone, get some confidence with your team. Going up to Penn State, that's I'm, I'm very excited just to see that uh, because I did think I see that Penn State's going to have you know fans are going to be full capacity like I think pretty much everybody is going to be. Uh, but you know, of course, you got the games against at LSU. Georgia's on the schedule in October once again. You close out Alabama, so some interesting matchups there. Uh, this is a tough schedule. I mean, this is the biggest thing, I think, when you look at Auburn. You know, you look at the players, you look at who they got coming back, the roster and everything. But that schedule is, is, is a pretty tough one. And like I said, that Penn State game early in the season, if they can get that one, that would just be huge for this team, I believe. But when you look at the schedule, what sticks out to you and where do you see as a, a good spot for Auburn to be when they get to the end of the year? Um, I, I see five games, Jordan. I think when you break it down, there's going to be five games uh, that, that really matter here, I think. You mentioned at Penn State, at LSU, versus Georgia, at A&M, and versus Alabama. I think Auburn wins the rest of those games. It's what are they going to do with those five games? Some people say Arkansas could be a, um, a trap game or Ole Miss. I'm not buying the Ole Miss hype this year. Um, that's, just, that's just me. But you know what, what can their record be with those five games? I think it could go anywhere. For, I don't think it will be 0-5. But I think it could be one and four. Like if they just win one of those games, that would not shock me. I don't think they can win more than three of those games. I think LSU is the most likely of those five, and then Penn State, and then A and M, then Georgia, then Alabama. I don't see them beating Georgia or Alabama this year. But could you beat the other three? Possibly. And then all of a sudden, what you're uh, you're eight and four or nine and three when it's done. And I think anything north of seven and five, uh, Philip is going to be a huge win. Yeah, I'm right there with you, and it seems like that's where we look at one preseason magazine. I'm not going to mention their names. You know, you got one at seven and five. You got one that I think uh, had nine and three. But so anywhere in there, I'm with you there. Especially when you're year one, new head coach. If you win eight or nine games, that's a huge win, and that gives you so much momentum going into the all you know all season. Especially then, hey, you win a bowl game, you go ten and three, you win ten games, first year head coach. I mean, it's going to be so much excitement going into year two under Brian Harson if that happens. And I'm right mm-hmm. there with you. I, I mean, I'm, I'm at the eight win mark for me I, when I look at Auburn. I think eight and four is very possible, and then nine and three. Like I said, that's just that's just a tremendous. So I'm I'm looking forward to it, man. Uh, doing these previews makes you get ready for the season. It can't get here soon enough. Media days can't get here soon enough, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I appreciate you coming on the show. I probably went a little bit longer here on the podcast than I told you I would, but I always appreciate that's the okay. fact when you when you come on the show but if anybody out there wanted to follow you and uh where they can check out uh locked on auburn and all the other great stuff you're doing yeah i'm on twitter at z blacker you can find all my content there and then uh of course locked on auburn your daily auburn tigers podcast uh got a new show that drops every morning it'll be up before you uh you wake up but yeah we uh we put out five shows a week all about 30 minutes or so Along with uh, with uh, juicy Auburn football, basketball, and baseball coverage. So, man, always uh, always a joy to join you. All right, once again, thanks to Zach Blackerby for joining the show this week. Always great to have Zach on to talk all things Auburn football. And uh, check out Locked on Auburn if you're an Auburn fan. They do a great job, like he said, Monday through Friday. Great Auburn content when you're talking about football, basketball, baseball. If you love the Auburn Tigers, you will love Locked on Auburn. And uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the show. Um, appreciate everybody checking the show out. Next week, we'll be previewing Georgia. And uh, I've actually already taped the preview. Uh, Palmer Toms from Dogs 24-7 will be on next week. Doing it different this year than last year. Last year, I went in alphabetical order. This year, I'm just randomly going with teams. So you never know who you're going to get from week in, week out. You know, I'm talking SEC when it comes to previewing all these teams before we get to the season. So it'll be really fun and an interesting conversation next week talking Georgia because a lot of high expectations for Georgia Bulldogs uh, this upcoming year. Uh, a lot of people expecting this team to be a title contender. As we, I have talked with Danny Ware, Troy Sadowski, many people 
about Georgia. Georgia is a team that's a lot of people talking about going into this upcoming season. And I hope everybody has a great 4th of July weekend. It's uh, going to be a long weekend for some. Some folks are are probably getting Monday off because of when the 4th of July is landing this year. But I hope everybody has a uh, has a great weekend and be safe with the fireworks and everything. And uh, just as always, love each other, respect each other. And uh, let's just, like I said, let's always be good to each other, you know. Uh Life can be hard sometimes, but uh, I think if we try to lift each other up more often, it's not as bad, and uh, it's actually pretty good, to be honest with you. Uh, remember, you can follow me on social media, at P. Jordan SEC. The podcast is available, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Blue Wire Hustle, of course. And if you are on Apple Podcasts, and i got to remember to say this, not subscribe, follow. That's the new, the new verbiage we're supposed to use. And also uh, rate and review. Leave a review. I will read it on a future edition of the show and of course um you can always email me at sports.philjordan at gmail.com once again hope everybody has a great fourth july weekend and until next week bye bye